Father, thank you for all the tests you've taken us through and all you have prepared for those who love you. And we do, or we wouldn't be here together today, Father. So I thank you for all you've done in each of our lives and all you have prepared for those who love you. We just worship you, God. Father, we worship you. Stand in awe of your majesty. Holy God, lead us now, we pray. Amen. 1 Thessalonians in verse 3. For our entreaty is not out of deception. That's our representation, our plea, so to speak. It's not out of deception. We're not here to deceive you. Nor yet out of uncleanness. We don't have any impure motives here. Nor yet with guile. You know, we haven't thought this out ahead of time in order to trap you. But according as we have been tested by God to be entrusted with the evangel, thus are we speaking, not as pleasing men, but God who is testing our hearts. Paul tells us why the Father tested him and his fellow travelers, quote, to be entrusted with the evangel. The bigger point here is this testing wasn't for the Father to discover anything. It was for Paul and the others. The Father already knows what's in everyone's heart. He's all-knowing, all-seeing, and everywhere present. He clearly doesn't need to test anyone to learn anything for himself. Therefore, any test you undergo is for you to learn what you need to learn. The Father already knew that Paul could be entrusted with the Evangel, but Paul must have needed to know it for himself and within himself with an unshakable confidence that he would need throughout his journey. One of my college professors told us the very first class, <laughs> he started right out saying he would be giving us pop tests without any warning. So we'd better be prepared, and we were, and it served us well. We knew he was serious, and he was as good as his word, because guess what happened the next day? Your faith, your faith is sure to be tested in some way, if it hasn't been already. You can't anticipate the pop tests, much less the bigger exams, and you don't even know you're in one most of the time until it's over. And even if you spot a big exam ahead of time, you never know all the questions and challenges that can come from all directions. But the point is, the testing that Paul referred to, that was to show that he and the guys he was with could be entrusted with the evangel, with the gospel. That wasn't for God. Any test you go through, that's not for God. That's for you. He already knows what you're going to do. He already knows what's in your heart. But we don't more times than you would imagine. We think we do, and then we find out after a test is over, or when a test comes even, then you find out what's in your heart for sure. This is where I was hoping you could talk about final exams. And yes. Early on, years ago, I had athletic stores, and I was on top of my game, and God was trying to make me usable for him. He was trying to make me a woman of God rather than a woman's liver. And he was trying to humble the proud so he could lift up the lowly. And I was failing all my tests. So God was just showing me how stupid what I was saying most of the time was and how it wasn't what his view of a woman of God would be like. Okay, so I would say stuff and he would say, Barbara, just be quiet. And then I would try. It's like, God, just put a watch on my mouth so I don't sin against you. He said, it's your mouth. Put a watch on your own mouth. And the person who was trying to mentor me said, Barbara, if you'll just go 180 degrees from what you would normally do, you'll be somewhere close to right. When the Holy Spirit's dealing with you on something, he's not going to let up praise his holy name. God is going to get what he's after. Anyway, time after time, God would deal with me by the Holy Spirit. He would give me a check in my spirit. It's like, why did you say that? And he was trying to groom me so that I might someday be usable. And it was, I mean, every day there was an example. Barbara, just shut up. And I just couldn't pass my shut up test. Now, maybe you don't know a God who talks to you like that. It's kind of like I've told people, if you've never heard God tell you no, I would highly doubt that you've ever really heard him say a true yes. 
Because he'll tell you no usually before he'll start telling you yes. Because that's how we train up our children in the way they should go. They have to learn boundaries. Anyway, so I just kept dealing with this mouth thing. I just would always, he would show me the futility of the old me in the business world during the time of the women's lib movement in the 70s and stuff. Then I realized one day I was just crying out to God, God, please help me. And he said, okay, I'm going to help you. He said, go to the garage. Okay. See that roll of duct tape? Yes. He said, write Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7 on it. It's like, okay. He said, now put it on your mouth. It's like, oh, my mouth, God, really? He said, yes. And I knew this was my final exam. I've watched people and in my own life where we take pop test after pop test for days and weeks and months. God was just dealing with me on my mouth and the words I spoke and the attitude behind them. And he was just really testing me on all this. But what I realized that day is the others had been pop test. Okay, repent, change, repent, change, get busted, repent, change. I just couldn't get it. But finally, I realized this is my final exam. That if I don't pass it, and this is what God showed me, this is your final exam. I've done everything I could to help you. And if I didn't pass my test that day, he was just going to go find someone who would. And I realized that day wearing duct tape with Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7 on my mouth, people who had never read the Word of God or who had a Bible at home that was dusty, man, they would dust off their Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7. So finally, my mouth with the duct tape was saying, was leading people to Scripture rather than away from the ways of God. So here's what I was wearing on my mouth that day, that God was imparting to every cell of my being in the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. Here's the big one. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. Verse 6, do not let your speech cause you to sin and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? That's the key. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words, there's emptiness, rather fear God. And God was training me as a business owner, as a mom in the professional world. He was training me for the day that he released me into ministry. He had to train me. I had to at some point be found faithful in little so I could be made ruler over much, so I could walk into the call and the gifting he had for me. But that was my training, owning sports apparel shops. That was my training field. Where's yours? What are you involved in that God's showing you how things look to him about what you speak? You know, these people who say, and we're massively into wellness, these people who say, my cancer, my disease, what are, you're owning it. Why are you doing that? Do you want to keep that thing? Do not let your speech cause you to sin. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the works of your hands? So what are we speaking what is in our voice? What is in our attitudes? But the mercy of God, he said, okay, today, if you want to say something, because I knew I couldn't take the tape off. If you want to say something, just offer it up to me as a sacrifice. Anything you'd want to say, just offer it up to me. And by the end of the day, God truly used the foolish things to confound the wisdom of the wise. By the end of the day, when I got to take that duct tape off, Man, through the years, I'd be ministering and I would start to go a different way that God didn't want me to go. And I would have this vision of God standing at the throne, standing up with a roll of duct tape, just daring me to go there. It's like, oh, sorry, God. Sorry, God. And I just got where I would just call it Holy Ghost bleeped because I just couldn't go any further. 
God gives pop test after pop test after pop test. But one day, they're going to take the final exam on that issue and either pass or fail. And if we choose not to humble ourselves in the sight of God, He has no problem humbling us. But that's where I learned about the pop test. And one day, God just done. His mercies are new every morning, but I tell you, His patience has a limit because He's looking for people He can use. The rest of the people who He can't use, then what's that life like? If God can't use you, I mean, you may go through breaking You may go through the consequences of your choices, but to not have a purpose in where God doesn't train you, Holy Spirit University, you used to call it, let the scourging of God begin when you woke (laughs) up every day. Let the scourging begin because God was teaching you as only he can. And I just call it HSU, Holy Spirit University, because God knows what he's after. You may think you can hide from people or present yourself to be something you're not, but uh -uh, God's watching it all. I just love it when you share stories about your journey. Thank you so much. I think we'll stop here for now, and we'll pick it up again tomorrow with more on testing and discipline. Until then, may Yehovah bless you and keep you. May Yehovah light up his face toward you and be gracious to you. May Yehovah lift his face to you and appoint peace for you. Amen.